This is Swarfcast. I'm Noah Graff. All right, so afterward, on the GI Bill, you you go to uh, business school. Where were you in business school? Uh, Harvard. Harvard. Not too bad. I bet you you were the only person in your class that had been a Navy SEAL. No, there were seven of us. Yeah. Seven. Yeah, seven. Every other Wednesday was Frogman Night Out. So it was, it was a good group, and there was actually uh, um, Harvard had a pretty. Uh, I, sh- I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have assumed that was. Yeah, you no, know. pretty pretty sizable uh, veteran uh, class population. Uh, they, they're 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 very uh, uh, big advocates of that, which was nice. Interesting. Okay, so you go to Harvard, one of the better places, um, and then. You know, lots of routes after business school. What what were you thinking? I like the leadership side of life. Um, so while a lot of classmates went to investing roles and consulting and things like that, I, I um, you know, I wanted I wanted to go to some place that really cultivated and appreciated leaders. Uh, you know, and at the time, you know, GE General Electric was sort of the gold standard. So. Hmm reached out through some connections and was able to get an offer um, with GE Healthcare here in Milwaukee. So that's what, uh, you know, I grew up in New York City and my wife grew up in LA and we had never been to Milwaukee before that. And in those GE days, you know, they moved people around so much that we didn't expect to be anywhere along. Um, But we came in 2002 and found it to be just a hidden gem. So we've really, we're 20 years in and love Milwaukee. Interesting. Well, I like Wisconsin. I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I, okay, Harvard, let's just touch on that a second. I'm just, I, you know, we we did our pre-interview and now like just millions of things are just popping in my head. You know, my best friend growing up, he went to Columbia Business School. He, he couldn't get into Harvard. Um, probably if he had been a Navy SEAL, he could have gotten into Harvard. Um, what do you learn in business school? You know, you're, you're in business now. Um, you've been in a lot of management positions. What do you learn in business school that prepared you for what you're doing now? And did it, do you think it, as far as what you learned, you could have learned something similar at a different school besides Harvard? Um, it's Harvard ma- mainly just for the connections for the, and for the, for the, for this, for the piece of paper. Um, well, I, mean, I think in, in, in general, in general terms for transitioning veterans, I think business school is, a an, an excellent choice, um, because it, it can allow you to, you know, come in with whatever background, you know, learn additional skills, acquire knowledge, and then go off in a new direction. But, you know, building on whatever you did prior, plus what, you know, business school taught you. And there is a, you know, there is a lot to learn, uh, you know, between the accounting and, uh, you know, Harvard really focuses on, it uses the case study method. So you're getting these snapshots into decision-making you know, I think maybe probably 400 cases over the over the two years. Um, so it's it's really useful in that because you're you know you're given pieces of information, you're given s- situations, scenarios, and everyone's coming off the same case, and you're discussing it as a group, you know, led by a professor. So it's 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 it, you know it, it, I think it was a great great approach, especially with an interest in leadership. Um, but in general terms, uh, business school is a great, uh, pivot point for transitioning military, I think. Okay. But what if somebody didn't go to the military? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, I think it's a good, it's a good pivot point for that too. Um, do you think that you can be pretty, I mean, clearly there are many people who are successful in business that. Sure. You know, know, definitely, you know, it, it, for me, it was a, you're part learning and part, uh, you know, a little bit of credential that, you know, who knows how things go, you know, you know, first years out of in the. Uh, right. And it's a ticket. 
you know. Yeah, and maybe and maybe you get if something doesn't go well, you get a little a second shot. Uh, so you know, you so sort of think think about stuff in those terms. But yeah, I mean, you, you it's it's fascinating, especially these days, uh, the state of learning and there's just so many resources out there. You can basically, you know, the tide has shifted from yeah. the learning resources being the scarcity to now there are learning resources of the abundance and the motivation is the scarcity. You know, you got to sort of, you know, dive in there and, you know, apply yourself to, to learning something. But, you know, I, I you know, I'll, I'll have courses from Udemy, Coursera, edX, you know, still to this day, just, you know, learn, learn learning new stuff. Um, podcasts. Podcasts. Yes. Yes. I, I, I you know, so, so subscribe to uh, probably about 30. Yours 30. Wow. That's yes. even more than me. Yes. Yes. Well, I don't listen to them all, but I, uh, I, it lets, it lets me pick, uh, pick what would be good topics. Very interesting. Okay. So you came to lovely Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. And you're working for GE yep. management. Well, Six um, Sigma Black Belt. Yeah. Six Sigma Black Belt. Yep. Had you been wanting to have your own company for a while? W was that kind of the end goal when you were in Harvard? It was. It was. It wasn't to like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to run GE. I'm going to be some big time CEO. You You wanted more something of your own. Yeah, you know, it's interesting when we in the when you're in the SEAL teams, you sort of, you know, peer over the fence at the rest of the Navy and you go, Woo, there's a lot of process, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of bureaucracy. Um Is there know, a total disconnect between the Navy and the Navy SEALs? To me, it just seems like a total different animal. Like you got these ones guys that are like in combat walking around with guns, and then there's people like Top Gun, and then there's people on a ship. Yeah. Am I looking at this totally simplistically, or? I mean, it's different. It's different. It's it, it, you know, they're really different communities. I mean, the the SEALs are closer to, frankly, the Army, and that's you know, Army with Special Operations Command and and such. Um, but look, you know the the big the big Navy. Yeah, there is more bureaucracy because you know they are handling bigger bigger things you know ships and battle groups and planes and you, you know you process is important and decision a lot of process you know in, in a way you know ge has a lot you know everything you do has a lot of zeros around it um you know at the time it was the most employees and maybe the most revenue of any company in the world and wow you know you got a there's a lot of you know bureaucracy there uh, I mean, some sometimes for a good reason, um, just because you, you, the decisions you make uh, expend a lot of resources and aren't you don't really can, can't pivot as much. Um, but it's interesting. So I give career advice to you know anyone who asks. Uh, you know, especially sort of coming out of uh, you know either the military or undergraduate or you know high school. You know everything. And I've got a uh, you know, an adage of go blue chip early. So, you know, try to go to a, a a known name brand company, ideally that has some sort of training programs, exposure to different areas, because that gives you an opportunity to figure out yourself, you know, what you like, yeah. what you don't like, what you're good at, what you're not good at. And also, you know, what kind of roles and fields might be interesting. What I mean, about just going straight to Pindell? <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't have liked it, um, you know, because I think actually, you know, GE, yeah, you did get, I, you know, Six Sigma Black Belt training, you know, really sort of root causing and critical thinking and all that and, you know, a numbers orientation. And I probably use, you know, that sort of a background more frequently at Pindell than I do you know, lots of other, you know, skills that I've learned. You know, that's, you know, just that sort of a fluency with data and a willingness to, or, you know, known approaches to understanding gathering it has been, has been good. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I had the ambition to buy and ideally grow, you know, company and companies, you know, going back to the, 
the military time. But you, know, you didn't did <clears throat> did you have did you have the idea of I'm going to start from scratch, or you were more like I want I want to just get something established and then grow it in my image. Um, no, I didn't. Uh, at the time, I didn't want to start anything from scratch. I, you know, I, you knew, you knew too much to, to try such a thing. Yeah. And I didn't, I don't know if I had any good ideas, <laughs> you know, maybe I did. Um, but it's interesting. So, you know, I go, go to GE, get the, you know, certain skill sets and, you know, follow my own advice. Uh, but I can remember talking with a, uh, a PE investor, a private equity investor here and giving him my ambition. And he, you know, he said, look, you know, you, if you have that ambition, you've got to number one, develop the skills to be successful at it. And how do you run that kind of a company and, and all, and then how do you develop the capital to make it possible? Um, and so he went from there, joined up with a left there to join up with a buddy for a, uh, you know, a Bain Capital backed uh, healthcare services company, which was a, you know, fascinating run, you know, it was uh, joined as the COO and we had a nationwide set of dialysis clinics. Um, we partner with kidney doctors to build and operate the clinics in their markets and uh, but you got you're much closer to the decisions, to the cash flow, to you know executing strategy, you know, and that experience, you know, built on the GE, but it was much more focused on the end goal of getting to the position of acquiring companies. So growth. is there is there something about manufacturing, machining, precision machining that you know gets you, or is it more just you love business and you love creating something successful. No, I think, I think the former, um, you know, I, I, although I probably looked at about 120 companies when I 120 was, companies you looked at. Did. So while you were, while you were in, no, the, I, I, I had, I had left some years later, I left, left, left employment. Uh, I, I had some cash in hand from a, uh, uh, sale of some equity and, and such and uh left employment to go on the hunt to acquire something probably looked at about 120 companies um you know 75 percent of the manufacturing but you know i couldn't feel luckier to have found uh number one a manufacturing company number two you know pindel um you know in this precision machining world where um you could apply a lean skill set you know, because if you're doing, you know, so we are Pindell, uh, we have, uh, you know, two facilities, a lot of CNC Swiss machines, multi-axis lathe, multi-axis mill in one, and then all Acme Gridley multi-spindle screw machines in the other. Um, and, you know, our our niche is complex parts at medium volume. So complexity. Medium, okay. Yeah, complexity, materials, tolerance. How many people do you have? Uh, about 80. About 80. Okay. Yep, about 80. And uh, you know, we don't do prototyping well, but we also don't do automotive high well. You know, we're in the thousand to a million piece category. And that's the kind of people that I'm used to. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And and having a lean background, a lean six sigma background was wow, that's just terrific. Because if you can figure out how to take a little bit of waste out of the production of one of those million pieces or thousand or hundred thousand pieces. And then that efficiency cascades over the balance. Uh, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a neat feeling and, you know, it's interesting, you know, being, you know, 10 years into ownership here, I have found a tremendous amount of parallels between advanced manufacturing and the special operations community, because at the heart of them, you know, we already talked about the role of sort of that floor leadership uh, in CO core, but at the heart, you know, both communities are composed of small, highly cohesive, highly trained teams enabled by advanced technology, you know, trying to do outsized things, trying to punch above their weight. Uh, you know, the SEALs, you've got all of that training and that capability, you know, emboldened or augmented by technology you know, trying to influence the battlefield. And here I have Swiss machinists, Acme machinists, um, who also enabled by a tremendous amount of technology, 
you know, and able to put out, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of millions of, you know, really complex parts. And did you look, did you look at anywhere else that was similar to Pindel when you were in your 120 companies? Uh, you know, a couple of lower volume, lower volume, not exactly tool and die, but, you know, bigger part, lower mix, uh, lower, lower volume manufacturing. Um, but this, this, this was great. You know, when I, uh, when I acquired Mark Pendel, second generation owner, he stayed on board full-time two years and, you know, you know, sort of a declining time commitment over the next, you know, five years, four years, four or five years. Um, you know, and it was great transfer of ownership. And it's really a tribute to him that he would, you know, after, you know, cash in the pocket, still be interested in the company and the team and the customers and all. And I mean, I'm sure that was part of the deal, you know. Well, two years but, was, but, the, you know, after two years, you know, no, no commitments, but you know, he stayed. Oh, he off. stayed more af- after the yeah, two-year commitment. Like four, four or five more. You know, and you didn't mind. It what? Yeah, not. It wasn't. It wasn't full time. He moved away. You know, went from make maybe three three days a week. You know, eventually down to one, and then you know, remotely available and stuff like that. So it was it was a you know a great a great transition, and it's uncommon for you know I, I think as you've seen in this industry for a seller to. Uh, care enough to stick around uh and and you know be just drawing a salary um you know you're not I, I i'm not sure i mean i've encountered quite a few actually people who sell the company and either stay on as an employee for a long time or uh, that's part of the transition i you know it, it it's it, good it's good to hear it's more common yeah um you know because graph pinkert is that's one of the things we're trying to grow is the you know, M and A consulting, quote unquote, for um, precision machining companies, and that seems to be kind of like one of the caveats of the deal is that pe- people need some guidance. You know, honestly, if you ever if you ever come across, you know, family owners that are oh, we got to talk after this. I, 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 we, we have, we may have something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because those or two things you can craft great, great transition and exit plans that uh, you know protect their legacy, you know, but get them out of uh, what they don't want to be doing anymore, um, and re- the responsibility and all of that. And you know, it often turns out to be better for the team and the customers and and all of that. Yeah. How uh, are you doing on time? I'm good. Okay, great. Uh, because I got a. Four thirty, um, my time. I've I've, I've got to go. But yeah, on. so you're on Central Time. Yeah. Okay. Well, good because I I can see this being a double episode. This is oh, this great. is great. Awesome. Uh, okay. So let's get back to the story. So you bought Pindell. Yep. You had worked for private equity. You had been in the military. You had gone to some snazzy schools. What was the first thing you do when you got there? Um, this is funny because, like, I wrote down all these notes, and all of a sudden, these things are just coming all, to me. All, like, all, all script, uh, all good. That's uh, why. That's that's the beauty of it. You 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 prepare, and then it goes oh, off script. It's, okay. I'm sure, you've experienced that in everything you do. Well, the uh, you know, the the military had a plan of no, or it had a adage of uh, no plan sur- survives the first contact. But I always like the who's the big boxer. Um, Tyson. Mike, Tyson. Mike Tyson. Yeah, everybody has a plan mm. until they get punched in the mouth. Exactly. exactly. I, I say that all the time. <laughs> I was saying that to somebody yesterday. <laughs> Love that quote. Yeah, and uh, you know, it, 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 it's it's funny, you know, because coming into Pindell, um, you know, I didn't I didn't have a grand plan for. You know, it was well performing. I didn't have a grand plan of I'm going to go in this direction or you know do something different or all that. It was really you know first a period of learning because uh, I don't have a machining background either. Uh, you know, I you know it was. Limited. So how did the people look at you? Did they look at you <clears throat> as who is this guy, Mister Harvard Business School? I didn't like... tell anyone that. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't go into any of those. Any yeah, of those. one of those Harvard 
Har- Har- Harvard people who no, no, my, no, no. my brother-in-law went to Harvard and I, I don't think anyone here even knows that so uh he, my brother-in-law went to Harvard and my wife always remarks that she loves him because he he never mentions that he went to Harvard unless somebody asks whereas I, I guess there people who go to Harvard are kind of notorious for right. oh, well, you, when I was at Harvard. May, may the, may, no, no, no. May the record show you asked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, OK, so you're there. Yeah. And you, know, you're, and, you're, uh, you don't tell people you went to Harvard. People look at you as who is this guy? So what what happens then? Yeah. You know, I think being having been a seal gives you. Okay, so they did uh, know that you were yeah, a seal. Yeah, I did totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, just, you know, because that you want to... That has more cred. And just, it's, you know, distinctive, but it's also, you know, a basis of, if you could be successful in that community, you know, we can tr- trust you, you know, here. Because that's what people are doing. I mean, they, you know, they, you need to build that trust and maintain it all the time. Uh, you know, are you consistent? Do you follow through? You know, are you, you know, <clears throat> rep- do you, do you, you know, are you ethical? Do you represent the company well? You know, and so you think because people n- knew you were a SEAL, that may have been something that at least latently they might have thought? Maybe, maybe, you know, it, at least it keeps them listening. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. So you're there. Yeah. Sorry, am I interrupting your train oh, of thought? That's good. Nope, I'm open. Okay, you're there. You got some good old fashioned acmes, nice slimy, oily workhorses churning out parts by the million and or at least hundreds of thousands. And you got some CNC. Was it was there CNC Swiss at the time? Uh, just some single spindle. One, yeah, only one one nice machine and two really old Swisses. Uh, so what most- were they? Let's offend uh, some people. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> no, what? It's okay. Oh, they're old. Nobody they're cares. Old. They're old. They, uh, Citizen, yep. Star, Sugami, what? Uh, one was a Sugami BE20 that was really nice. And then um, two two older citizens. You know, because you got to understand that uh, the way Mark had built the business was, and you, you, you'd be in a better place to tell me if this was typical, but he, the model he and his earlier his father had built was blank the parts out of the multi-spindle and then sure. bring them over to you know cnc like machines for secondary operations so right, but not swiss like you not know swiss, you're no about, i mean right. so you know really the swiss are sort of well underutilized when i showed up i mean they there wasn't much of it there really wasn't a team around them most of it was mills for secondary operations we did have some you know used mianos um you know so you come in not knowing much about machining and then did your analytical mind look at the swiss machines and go oh this this seem we can make the part complete on these that the and there's we can make you know big bucks on one of these parts and and so was that your kind of your idea to to build that yep yep and uh it, it, what was helpful was when I came in, we had about uh, 1.2, 1.5 million in outside machining spend. So someone else making our parts. And they're typically the more sophisticated parts that you couldn't just blank off, you know, in multi spindles and, you know, get set the secondary ops right. So we, uh, so I saw that bucket of money and I go, okay. You know, so you crunched the numbers and you were like, right. You know, if we, you know, go out on a limb, get some Swisses to insource some of that work, instead of paying someone else to do it, we're doing it. That helps pay for the machine. Doesn't fill the machine up. And then you get to sell some of that extra capacity on a nicer machine. And, right. And so you already had some of the jobs already for the Swiss oh yeah. machines. Oh yeah. I mean, we, we used to have a whole wall of one of our plants that was four shelves, four big shelves high, you know, four pans deep, uh, you know, and whatever, it's like 40 feet wide. That was all, we called it whip. So that those were all the parts that came over from the multi-spindles that would get 
peeled off over time to have secondary ops done. And, you know, at this point today, we're down to like five pans. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's... Right. So it's, you're still I, using the multis, but not but not for blanking, but for making 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 real real parts. The mul the multis are making parts one and done, and they're not dipping down into five ten thousand piece runs, uh, which they had been. You know when you're blanking off. Uh, so the multis are for industrial stuff. Yeah, like yeah. what kind of work? You know, you know hydraulic components, pins. Uh, you know, various you know valve valve components. Um, so you know, like inch and a quarter diameter. Or... Yeah, yeah. We we have two that go up to two and five eighths. Uh, but you know most are inch and a quarter, uh, inch and a quarter and below. And you uh, have good people who know how to run them. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, great people. Um, you know the, as you know, the biggest risk to a multi spindle shop is not a hurricane, a tornado, some natural disaster. It's a team that is aging out, about to retire, no no reinvestment, no training, uh, no knowledge capture, um, and it just, just goes. Uh, but our average age on the multi-spindle side is probably 31. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, we've so taken... how do you get how do you get 31 year olds? Do they pay do you pay them twice as much to run those and then the CNCs? <laughs> well, you know, it's so it's interesting. Um, going back to our discussion on NCO development, we have taken a page out of the military's playbook and we implemented what we call the Pindell Professional Development Program. And we have six levels of multi-spindle machinist, six levels of CNC machinist four of quality technician and four of industrial maintenance. And in every level, we integrate tooling you by SME. SME yeah, uh, that's great. Tooling, yeah, tooling you classes um, where we allot time for people to take them. Tooling you classes, shop floor qualifications, and NIMS credentialing, uh, you know, slotted in at various levels. So, you know, we are, you know, as you know, if you can fi find someone that knows multi spindles, grab them. You know, it's it's gold. Yeah. But we are, you know, we are with a professional development program, and now that you know the team to be training them, we're willing to hire for attitude, train for skill. Um, oh, that's the best. Yeah, it's really good. And um, you know, and to your earlier question. You know, our the first three levels of multi spindle machinists in our professional development program are paid more than the first three levels of CNC. You know, yeah. because, I mean, significantly more, or a couple dollars more. Uh, probably more more than a couple dollars. Um, yeah. No, you don't have to answer this, but I'd be curious if if you want to answer this. What are what are the ranges of um, you know, pay? there and and feel free not to it's it's difficult because in different parts of the country you know ten dollars an hour in one part of the country is okay and ten dollars in another part of the country is like what the hell you know so okay you don't have to you don't have to answer that yeah what i'll say is when i first came in it almost seems i can't believe it was this low but you know it was like 12 or third, $12 or something for someone coming into say multi-spindle without any experience. Um, you know, and that was how many years ago? 10. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's, you know, you know, significantly higher, you know, our, our starting pay on the, on, on the multi-spindle, you know, before the person sort of proves themselves for 90 day is uh, $18. Okay. Um, just the start. Just the start. Yeah. And, you know, it can go up pretty quickly after that. Um, yeah. Cause if you find someone that likes that, uh, you know, that, that area, that's great. I mean, I can remember we had, uh, and maybe the, the pay, it's not even like more reward for getting dirty. It's more reward to attract somebody to try it. You think it's that? Well, I, mean, I think, uh, and then people might really like it. Yeah. But and a big portion of the reward is if you can 
you know, be able to manually adjusting your tools and watching your parts. Because you know, multi-spindles can make a lot of parts uh, quickly. They can also make a lot of bad parts quickly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you want a team that cares about quality. And when I came in, we didn't, we actually didn't have ISO 9001. So I, uh, I led that effort uh, within the first year of owning, you know, just being, having been a black belt, you know, calling people into a conference room and asking them to talk through their process as I captured in a process map was a great way to learn the business. Uh, so, you know, and having sort of a fluency with documents and all that. So I led that. I do say, you know, just a couple of years back, we got a uh, AS9100 and I did not lead that. You know, we had a great team to, you know, lead that effort of getting our aerospace certification, um, which is, which is great. Um, you know, so I'm very proud of them. Okay. So you've got a respect for both the Acmes that were sort of an established thing. And then you built the Swiss up. Um, and you've tried to create an identity, almost two companies for the, t for, for both things, even though it's all under Pindell Global Precision. Can you explain the sort of the separation you made and why? Yeah, we just, we found that uh, you know, aerospace companies, medical companies want to have a pure play supplier for the type of components that they need, which are, in most cases, Swiss components, uh, you know, or, or multi-axis late, but C, let's just say CNC components. Um, they, they, you know, you're really not going to use Acme's to make aerospace or, you know, at least we haven't, we haven't done that. Um, I don't know if others in the industry have, um, you know, but that customer feedback that we got was, you know, I, I, I want to be, you know, we, we want our parts over here on these machines. And in turn, a lot of industrial customers that might have wanted CNC components, but also were biased towards multi-spindle, didn't want to have the costs, the burdens that we had on the on the Swiss and on the CNC um, affecting their. I mean, it's all their perception. It's correct. just correct. Yeah, and so we yeah we incubated another brand name, Liberty Precision, that focuses uh, specifically on uh, aerospace defense. Uh, I find that really interesting. I mean, I spoke with a interviewed another guy with a Swiss shop a little while ago, uh, Sean Gaskin. I don't know if you heard it and. He has a separate company. He does medical, but then he has a separate company for like implantables. Interesting. Um, oh. Maybe it was because of that. Like he wanted just to show, you know, this one is even more glamorous than the other one or I don't well, know. Yeah. I mean, we didn't want to, when we got their aerospace certification, we didn't want to get it on the, the on the multi-spindle plant too. Um <clears throat> You know, because there's a tighter, uh, there's just extra costs there that you don't necessarily want to burden your uh, industrial customers with that aren't aren't as interested in that. Um, sure. So it could be something like that. Like he only wanted to get the 1345 on a portion of his operations, not- That might've been it. That might've been it, getting the certification on a portion of it. Um Okay, a couple let's let's go rapid fire cuz this has just been fantastic and I know um we have a little time constraint. Uh So first um I like to ask people um often what's something that you learned uh last week or um you know or read or heard in a podcast that just struck you. It it, it can be anything. I'm just curious what, you know, something or something that struck you emotionally. Got it. Got it. Um, <laughs> you know, I guess something on Swarfcast, maybe. Well, I, I, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, I'm, you know, uh, I'm reading this uh, fascinating book by a guy named John Gardner uh, called uh, 
He wrote Excellence, Self Renewal. He was actually the only Republican in Johnson's administration, Johnson's cabinet. John uh, Gardner. All right. I'll write that yeah. down. You know, and he founded Medicare, uh, or he was the thought leader behind it. Um, yeah, but he wrote this book, uh, it's called Self Renewal. And uh, I think it has a lot of application to, you know, where we are society wise, you know, in terms of uh, at a period where institutions need to be renewed, uh, you know, transformed or, or, or not renewed, pushed, pushed aside, you know, there's, um, you know, I take, I take, you know, points of it are, you know, relevant to, you know, manufa- manufacturing companies. How do you, how do you sort of continually renew and refresh for, you know, the next hill to climb? Um, you know, we've got a, uh, we've got a goal out to the team. I call it the two fifty fifty plan. So our goal is the two double the business uh, in four years, increase by 50% um, the, the operating margin and increase by 50% uh, individuals pay or compensation, you know, whether it's wage or bonus or, or all of that. Cause if you can get, yeah, if you can get the first two, the third's possible. Uh, and so, you know, we're sort of, we're, we're working on that plan, um, you know, with all the, you know, hopeful benefits that come with it in terms of, you know, growth and training and fulfillment and all that, and all of that. Uh, so part of that sort of renewal process there. Very interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, one, one more question, uh, just a, a nice zinger, um, when you when you think of happiness, what do you think of? Um, I think of friendships, uh, you know, family, um, you know, a sense of contribution uh, and a sense of accomplishment. Um, yeah, you know, I think. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a people person. So I, you know, definitely. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, if, if it's funny, there's, uh, I was reading, reading a, some article about, you know, there's a German, t- German term schadenfreude, which is basically you take happiness in other people's misery. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've, heard, I've, I've heard this recently. Yeah. Right. Well, there's in this article, it said there's a opposite term for that, which is like, Freudenfreud, you you take happiness in their happiness, in their you know in their you know success, uh, and I think I'm much I'm much more the latter. You know I I I like you know my family to, you know individual family members friends uh, others to be uh, to be successful. Um, you know I you know I I want my employees to be successful. You know I think they're I think this is a wonderful profession to be in, I think we're at a unique period of history, especially for the, for this country where, you know, the opportunity, I, you know, I say to my team, automation is not your enemy. Automation is your friend. Because if you can program it and troubleshoot it and repair it, maintain it, that's your ticket to a higher wage. And with that, you know, especially up in Milwaukee, you know, Wisconsin, We've got this manufacturing ecosystem, you know, complementary manufacturers, you know, we machine, but I don't heat treat or plate or grind. You know, I got that within 15 minutes. And we've got this wonderful ecosystem that goes back 120 years. Wow, that's great. Yeah. You know, you know, Alan Bradley founded in 1903, same year as Harley Davidson, you know, all you know, all of that. And you know, it's this wonderful ecosystem. And you take that, you take a highly trained and a highly trainable workforce that we have, and you layer on top of it automation and AI um, to augment the output of any individual, you know, the the, the folks in this market. Uh, And I think that's the pathway for the upper Midwest and, you know, in the U.S. in general to becoming the manufacturing powerhouse to the world, you know, again, you know, because we were there, you know, Milwaukee, Wisconsin was known as the you know the the small motor uh, capital of the world. The, you know the 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 machine shop to the world. Um, 
you know, Racine, you know, for, you know, Hamilton Beach and, you know, small motors. And I think, I think that's, that can be all in our, in our future. Um, that's awesome. You know, yeah. We should have, or we will. I mean, we, if we work on it the right way and you, and I can talk another time, you know, I think, uh, you know, I think, I think we need to think as a society very differently about upskilling, you know, and upskilling different from education. Uh, but if we can, if we can solve the upskilling problem, you know, not only have we created a mechanism to renew society, but we've created the mechanism to take advantage of those trend lines, you know, those, that ecosystem, AI, automation, uh, it's not a, a low way, you know, our future is not a low wage play. Our future is a high wage play, but it's a even higher output play, um, so, yeah, you know, l- along the way here, I'd love to, love to talk to you about, I do a lot, give a lot of thought to. Uh, ups- yeah, that'll be the next one. This, sure. this was so fantastic. Thing. I mean, pray to God, the recording's great uh, and um, loved it. And this is going to come out next week. So I really appreciate it. Noah, awesome. Really love the conversation. It's uh, It's nice getting to know you better. I love it. 